morning and welcome. This is the 15th annual Litchfield Tea and Poetry Series. Uh, it's sponsored by our friends of the Waccamaw Library, or FOWL, uh, and we're, we're so grateful and thankful for them for all their support uh, and their involvement in the life of the library. Uh, my name is Dan Turner, and I am the head of uh, programming and outreach for the Georgetown County Library System. Uh, and we are here with a great program uh, for, to kick off this 15th uh, annual Litchfield Tea and Poetry Series, uh, Sweet Home Carolina, focusing uh, this year on all South Carolina-based poets. Uh, so that, that'll be a lot of fun, and we'll see the diversity of poetry being produced across our state. Uh, and I do want to say uh, thank you uh, to Susan Lauder Myers and Linda Ketron, who began this series 15 years ago, uh, as well as Cliff Saunders, uh, who helped run it, and Libby Bernadine, uh, wonderful folks uh, who, have, who have been uh, uh, so important in keeping this series going. It's, it's one of the recognized series throughout the state and the region. So thank you to, to Susan, Linda, Cliff, and Libby. Um, also, as we're listening to our poets read today, uh, please, if you're uh, watching out there on Facebook Live, uh, add a, a question or a comment in the comment section of that Facebook event. And uh, John Lane and Emily Roscoe, our poets today, will respond to your question. So we'd love to hear from you out there and use that, uh, that comment section to get in touch with us. All right. All right, so we're, we have two excellent poets um, right here in our state, and they're going to take us from the Piedmont, the upcountry, the upstate, all the way down uh, to the sea, to the, I guess, from the, the hills to the, to the dunes here. Um, John Lane from Spartanburg and Emily Roscoe from Charleston. Very unique uh, poets, different styles, but both uh, glorious in, in their own ways. So we're thrilled to have them. Uh, I'll start off by introducing uh, John Lane, and he'll give his reading. Uh, then we'll come back and introduce Emily, and she'll give hers. So John Lane is a, a great friend of the library. He's uh, been here for several programs uh, featured with his work. Uh, John is an essential voice of the Southern ecology. He's the author of more than 15 books of poetry, fiction, and nonfiction. His poetry explores in depth the wildness of this native state of South Carolina. He attends to the arresting beauty and fierceness of the landscapes, waterways, and wildlife around us. Uh, John uh, was an English professor and founding director of the Goodall Environmental Studies Center at Walford College for many years. Um, and his recent books include Abandoned Quarry, that's poetry, Anthropocene Blues, poetry again, and then a brand new novel, Whose Woods These Are. Uh, so please uh, welcome in John Lane uh, from the upcountry. <laughs> Thanks for being here, John. Great to see you again. Thanks, Dan, and I'm zooming in from Spartanburg. Thanks, Emily, for, for being here. I'm looking forward to hearing your poems, and thanks to everybody there at the library um, for um, working through um, the um, complexities of being online. Yes. Um, we, um, we, we've done a good job here of, of getting, getting that going. I'm going to read for about 15 minutes, and I'm going to... Um, Emily knows that this is um, it's always challenging and exciting to read new work, work that's never been been aired before. And all my poems today are going to be poems I've written since late November. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, sort of the ways my my poetry's changed or, or, or at least the subject matters changed during the pandemic. We, we went um, underground in March and um, at that point. Um, even though I, I knew the area around my house very well, I've written a book about it <laughs> called Circling Home. Um, I, I started spending more and more time in a preserve that's right behind our house that you've got to, you got to slip through a little bit of property, but then boom, you're on this 200 acre preserve with a creek, a river through it. And I would go down there and, um, walk, walk, we would walk every day to get out of the house. 
And um, a few of the poems I'm going to read are about that. But the first poem I'm going to start with is um, a poem. Um, Dan says I should give a little bit of writerly advice. And here's, here it is right up front. Um, read, 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 read. Um, if you're going to be a writer, you got to read. And um, so I, I was reading a book by one of my favorite um, landscape writers, a British writer named Robert McFarlane, um, this spring. And he's he's turned his he's turned his ear to poetry, and he's he started writing these things he calls spells. And he's got two books out of them now, and they're just selling like crazy, and people love them. And one the first one every Every elementary school in Great Britain bought a copy of it for the library. It was called the um, um, the Book of Spells or something. Let's see. I'm sorry. The Lost Spells. The Lost Words. But this spring he published another book called The Lost Spells. Here's his cover. And I was reading it, and he has a line in it that's where a blue jay is speaking. I'm going to have a read a poem where a turtle speaks in a minute. I know I'm violating every poetic um, convention there is by doing this, but... But um, a, a jay speaks in this poem, and the jay, and he says to the jay, "Jay, jay, plant me an a- acorn." And the jay says, "I will plant you an acorn, and I will grow you an oak that will live for a thousand years." And I went, "Oh, how great!" But we had a tornado pass within a half mile of our house um, this November. And we lost a lot of oak trees in the neighborhood. And my wife, Betsy, started looking very cautiously at all the trees around our house. And so I wrote this poem um, called The Worry Oak. The Worry Oak. The storm is a retreating army foraging our hidden provisions. The Worry Oak roots are sodden oatmeal. Not the nourishing ropes that climb to heaven, not the sinews the worry oak rides to eternity. The roots snap in the least wind, but we can hear, can't hear them. Instead, we watch the hula dance above our rafters, thinking that is the big show. We gauge the gale of grievances, weather pitches at us, mortal and secure in this thimble of human certainty we call a home. That stabbing music, acorns, tap dancing on the roof, bound for a sodden yard where squirrels would mire in our acres if they would just abandon their huts of sticks high in the air. They've made our mistake thinking they can sleep it out, nestled among a compost of insulting leaves, heir to what remains every fall of a proud forest, a rainbow so striking that inside, thumbtacks hold the scene to our wall in places where trees are now two-by-fours, ghost of the beast that threatens our surety. Dawn is hours away. Rain pulls me from sheets made a nest by wear, but rising is not enough. The quail, the fear, the worry oak outside our window will split our house in two, a sandwich on a cutting board. First light, I stare up into the dilemma of limbs. Okay, so during the pandemic, I started walking into the preserve every every day. And I um, late in the fall, I noticed there was a box turtle that I saw every day. And it didn't seem to be moving at all. And I worried about it. I worry about the oaks. I worry about the box turtle. And um, so I started like building little little piles of brush in front of it and to make sure everybody saw it if they walked past it. And I I would mark every day where it was. And I would um, I would see this box turtle every day until it finally disappeared. Um, I knew which box turtle it was because it had a little piece missing from its shell. I'd seen it for two or three years. I'd noticed it in other parts of the preserve. So here's a series of questions I ask of the box turtle. It's not actually a box turtle speaking, but it's me speaking to a box turtle. Maybe poetically that's a little more, a little safer. Questions for the box turtle. Why do you sit stationary in dry grass as I stand over you? Why has your range shrunken to a 30-foot mandala 
over 14 days. Do you sense I check on you every morning, measuring your progress against my own sacred circling? Do you enjoy Brussels sprouts? I left you some when I thought you were sick because of a whisper of spume on your nose. In your idling brain, does future swirl a room full of milky clouds? Is everything seasonal? Is it already bedtime for the extended sleep your blood perpetrates? When I did stop being so adamant, was it because of my barometer's protocols? Why do you see beyond the bedclothes of your cloistered eyelids? Is silence a seance? Do you trouble, do I trouble your waters? What do you feel when I pick you up? Do you sense yourself rising like resurrection, a savior with built in flak jacket against this intruder's demands? Where are the doves departing your parked ark, your breath, a branch falling nearby? Will you open your eyes when kingdom comes? Or will you endure rain's choir blattling around you? How could I know who I am? Why should you care unless it is, and why should you care unless I was intent on coring you out like a ham in a tin can or carrying you home in my mouth like a Labrador patrolling the woods? All right, I'm going to follow that with one more turtle point. The same box turtle, a different poem. And this one was, this one came directly out of Robert McFarlane's book. I decided that like Robert McFarlane, I would write my own spell because we needed spells during this pandemic. And this one's called a spell for the box turtle. Bring me armory and I will crawl. I will haul my house forthright too. Overshadow speed with plod. Intersect scattered fruity places, xylographer of woody glades. My trail writes enduring glen stories. Triple your time, rake persimmons under a stand of trees. Draw from ruined chanterelles the essence tended by frost and low sun. Leave me behind if you cannot envy my locomotion and my taste. I'm going to read one more, a little bit longer poem. And um, then I'm going to read a poem by my friend G.C. Waldrop as my poem by somebody else. This one, um, I'm working on a prose book now about soil and gullies in the Piedmont and my exploration of that landscape with them, with these scientists as they explore this um this place up here and they go back and they they look at um, research that was done back in the 1930s by the Soil Conservation Service. And one of the stories that came out of that, that I have a whole chapter about, is the fact that Albert Einstein's son, Hans Albert Einstein, worked for the Soil Conservation Service in Greenville, South Carolina, for five years during the 1930s. And Einstein actually came to visit him in Greenville three or four times. And um, I've got another poem about that that I wrote 20 years ago when I first heard about this, but about Einstein, because they say that Einstein would come and that he would wander around Greenville and he would get lost and little boys would have to take him back home because he couldn't find his way. So I've got a poem about that. But this one is a little more complicated. Um, his research was um, on the Ennery River. And Einstein and the Soil Conservation Service built a flume that that covered the entire length of the river. Did, I'm sorry, width of the river, and the water would run through it. And Einstein would would study the sediment rate, the amount of um, sand and gravel and clay that would that would get um, would become would come go into transportation when the river would rise and fall, and that's what he did. I've got a great picture of him standing in the Ennery River measuring this sediment. Um, but I went over there in a canoe with a soil scientist from Duke, and we paddled a section of the Ennery that has this 80-year-old flume, the remains of it, in it, and we visited this flume, and that's what um, 
this poem's about. This is called, Does the Ennery River Remember Hans Albert Einstein? Ask the scientist and the poet in a small green fiberglass canoe pulling over deadfall from two miles upstream to reach this altar of the past. Ask woody debris, carbon storage, wildlife bridges, a deer stampede, perplexed suburbanites lounging on the screen side, stream side. Ask arrival by self-propulsion to that hidden, forgotten spot on the Ennery River. Ask Hans Albert Einstein himself, his lab built in the 1930s, a research bloom for measuring sediment bed load in a river. Ask Einstein's aged instrument formed of depression error concrete. Ask the thick river comb, piano keys, the river plays for us. Ask the formed shoots the current drains through downstream like a boulder garden. Ask the scientist up to his knees, drumming on concrete with his paddle, making wild river jazz. Ask if an argument can be made that sediment is something to be understood. Ask about 80 years measured not in history, but in floods and droughts. Ask Einstein's very artifact approached by water, on the late, in the late fall, ask Einstein's cause concrete osmondius cast on nice, flick with algae, yet not yielding. Ask decades of floods, ask the jet taking off at the nearby airport, ask poison ivy and greenbrier, ask the sweet gum snapped by high water somewhere upstream and strung like a bow in the current, Ask cedars on the far side, ask only green, ask hence the last fall color, ask Gibbs Shoals downstream stretching all the way to the Vietnamese Catholic Church, ask the scientist Tippy Canoe still upright like a fallen leaf, ask the schema we brought along, a ghost of the service to science Einstein performed, ask his fluvial data stored off-site in the National Archives, ask the territory, ask the mystery, ask the slab fingers laid parallel with slots for some contraption, ask the flow, ask a flight of doves above, ask the river in its own language. All right, my last poem. This is a strange one. This is my friend GC, who's about as different from my um, aesthetic as anybody could be. Um, G.C. Waldrop's a wonderful poet who teaches at Bucknell University and his new book, oh, there we go, his new book, which is called The Earliest Witnesses, just came out from Tupelo Press. And here's a little poem of his. His poems are usually long, but this one's a little shorter. And this one's called I Have a Fever and Its Name is God. G.C. is Amish as well. I have a fever and its name is God. The nurses come in shifts and worship it. All around me, the land suffers from the loss of love's handkerchiefs. Children sing brackish rhymes in the lowest schools. There is no key, only the locked door projected onto the city wall. In my dreams, I run from it. The nursage, nurses bandage my body in mathematical problems I can't solve. I tell them, no, no, measure me by the sweetness of honey. Hush, they whisper. Our names, too, are written in the book of the smallest moon. You were brought here in the traitor's black ambulance. Your brother is a scar. The nurses place bowls of fruit around my prone body as sacrifices. No, not to you, they explain, but to the heat you bear. Finally, I stumble through the image of the door in broad daylight. No one stops me. I am prescient as a lilac. But the nurses say, we will leave you. They have prepared a feast. They have sewn my wedding garment. There are, no, there are so many of them, far too many to count. Each of them lifts a piece of me to her mouth. By this sweetness of honey, let me, by my works, be undone. So that's G.C. Waldrop. Thank you.
Thanks, Dan. Thank you so much, John. That was that was wonderful uh, the whole way through, and great to hear the new poems uh, that you're. You continue to, to churn out poems uh, in addition to all your other projects, the, uh, including that fascinating uh, prose uh, book that you're working on about the, the soil uh, itself up there in Spartanburg and the histories involved. So thank you so much, John, for that um, and for the G.C. Waldrop poem as well uh, and your writerly advice, read, 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 read. I think I, I got it right. And read. There's a fifth one there, uh, which is perfect, of course, uh, for a library. We love love to hear that uh, and read to write. Well, thank you so much, John. And we'll we'll come back to you for our, our Q and A segment again, folks uh, uh, out there. You feel free to type in anything you'd like to to ask John Lane or coming up now, Emily Roscoe. Uh, these are wonderful poets and wonderful uh, teachers of poetry. Uh, so please uh, you know, pick their brains. We got them here uh, at, at our disposal today. Uh, all right, well, next up, a very, uh, a very different uh, kind of poet. I think we'll hear that. But uh, Emily Roscoe, uh, but uh, wonderful and accomplished as well. Uh, and so we'll, we'll hear this unique uh, style that Emily has. Emily Roscoe is author of Weather Inventions, Prop Rockery, winner of the Akron Poetry Prize, and Raw Goods Inventory, uh, which won the Iowa Poetry Prize. Um, so wonderful uh, prize-winning collections there, uh, three so far. Um, she is also editor of A Broken Thing, Poets on the Line, and she serves as poetry editor of Crazy Horse, uh, a wonderful journal uh, run out of the College of Charleston. Uh, Emily received the Wallace Stegner Fellowship at Stanford and the Ruth Lilly Fellowship. So she is uh, quite accomplished there too. Her poems appear in Epic, Pleiades, and Tupelo Quarterly, among many other venues. And Emily is Associate Professor of English and Director of the MFA Creative Writing Program at the College of Charleston, uh, just down the road, uh, down Highway 17 a piece uh, from us here. Uh, so we'll go from the Piedmont down to the Low Country. And Emily, thank you so much for, for being with us. Uh, John's an old friend of the library, and now you're a new friend, and we're, we're thrilled to have you along. I'm pleased to be here this morning, so thank you, Dan, for inviting me. And what a pleasure to read alongside John. And uh, thanks to all of you who are tuning in this morning. Yeah. So I thought I would start my portion of the reading with sharing a poem by another poet. And it's a little bit of an odd duck. And I wanted to sort of wrap up, wrap in my writerly advice in my introduction here to this poem that I'm going to read. And it's really sort of a very compressed craft lesson. Uh, with my students, I spend a lot of time attending to the craft of what I call the activated voice in poetry. An activated voicing is, I believe, one of the very unique elements that defines the genre of lyric poetry. Because unlike fiction, you know, a poem does not need narrative scaffolding. It doesn't need an established character in order to speak. The speaker of a poem is immediate. Uh, the minute there's language in a poem, we are plunked down in that lyric consciousness. We are part of that I on the page. So that the moment in place of our reading creates the effects that the poem is presently happening. And this is like sort of the special magic I feel of, of a lyric poem is there's this unified space of two minds that gets created. The act of reading a poem places us both as an audience member hearing the poem, but also as a performer delivering the lines so that the poem's voice can feel to be our own uh, as we're reading it. And this is something I constantly try to seek uh, in my own writing. And I think it's something I have certainly not perfected, but I, I, I turn to a lot of poets who do this very well. I think Sylvia Plath does this very well. Um, I think, uh, and then this poet that I'm, this poem I'm going to share with you now uh, by Phyllis Janowitz, who was one of my teachers when I was an MFA student at Cornell. Um, 
she's a sort of tremendous but often overlooked poet. And I think she's a master of this thing, this activated voicing. And I hope that will be evident um, as I read the poem titled The Party. And I think we're going to be able to share it up on the screen, I hope, so that you can follow along. Something speechless wants to say something. I am, I am, I am. Or making its way around each couple. How nice for him, how nice for her. And then wave a glass at the room. But where is a suitcase of smiles for something speechless? Who lives in a cloudy peat bog with no flowers? Who each day waters a garden of eggplants and each day walks the dog? Who wants to say, it is like this, it is like that? Who wants to discuss trade agreements and the National Enquirer? Whose eyes in the morning grow darker? Who at night dreams of crowds weeping and fainting beneath whizzing combustible words? I tell my students, I think that's probably the most brilliant poem about sort of social anxiety, right? That feeling of I want to be someone who's the center of attention at a party, but I'm just not good at chit chat kind of stuff. So my, my students always really appreciate a poem that does that, that finds a way to bring to life those kind of awkward emotions and spaces that we often find ourselves in. So, OK, I'm going to turn to my own work. Um, I think I have about eight poems to read with you. Um, I'm going to start with a poem. Um, from my, my newest book, Weather Inventions, I'm just going to read one poem from this, and then I'm going to turn, just like John, to some, some fresher work, some newer work that's part of a manuscript I'm currently working on. So the poem I'll share from Weather Inventions is called uh, Riverdi, and I'm probably butchering the French a little bit. It's a French word uh, that is also, it means regreening, and it's a traditional kind of lyric song or lyric form that is... Um, Calling for, calling for spring, welcoming spring. River D. Call back spring and the migrations of birds. Winter has sheared down the birches to kindling and ash, but from the gray, the new green budding. Call back the spring if spring is still a season. Suffer winds to calm the northerlies, the ground defrosting and opening to dew. Spiders spin their filthy, lacy strings. Spring unrolls a muddy field, the fecundity of clay, golden pollen sensualizing the air. Dower burst and thickened xylems, the upthrusted oozing nectar sweetening the ongoing infidelities of the bees. We'll lie in the meadow, press flesh to flesh against the damp, warming dirt, next to the earthworm, deconstructing all remains. The grass unstitches to seed, sky a misted gauze that makes no promise for what's planted or buried. The poems that I'll, I'll read from here on out are from a manuscript I'm currently working on and um, just trying to think about what to say about this, these poems as a whole. I think they're really just they're really interested in exploring the complexities of human entanglements and human relationships. And I think that'll come out as I read them. None of these poems really require any kind of extra information or setup. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and just read them straight through. This is called A Phase. Say it plainly. We will hurt each other. Your voice across dry cornfields drips resignation into the phone line. Whisper thin as lace, sister of cobwebs, mouth fed by crumbs. You empty your midnight into my dreams, and I am not prepared. And so I sink into the one platitude you hate most, sharpening an edge of you I would not allow, drawing you back to the electric backfeed of whatever deafening noise a misfiring brain makes. I knew then, but dismissed it. Some excuse to disconnect. Outside, the compost pile steams through the new layer of snow. The one star visible between the mulberry's branches told me it was okay. And then for once, you, we, we're full of the wildest noise. Now I have learned to grow less quiet, 
It's my turn to call to you as you would to me, sister with a garland of lice. Girl packed sheet by sheet under tissue gown. Girl who is marble still within the sunlight. Please answer me when you are ready. The next poem is titled First Lesson. At the end of our childhoods, the forest thinned. The pine needle coated ground gave way to gravel, then concrete ahead. We dragged our feet to make a trail in case we could return. Bird rustle in the high branches. Tiptoed closer past the canopy toward the open wind. We looked back to where we had been. The trees dematerialized to ones and zeros, a fine mist settling in. Caught, we thought, one last glimpse of the fox seeking sun in the rain. Or was it a trick of light playing on the coarse woody debris? We turned up our collars, our jackets too short now at our wrists. Thought for a moment we could sing our way back in. Cedar, linden, ash, and beech. At once, a chorus of squirrel screech ushered us out, and then we knew. Horse and Ripple When we emerged from the willow's bridal veil curtain, we were no longer sisters, though at the lake's edge startled away. Palmed a stone in my hand's cup. As if to impress you one last time, I skipped it over the water's glass surface. Wanted you to catch the precise quick dimples, a hundred ringlets the wake its weight creates. Instead, you turned, stepped toe to ankle to knee into the water, cold with morning. Then you swam out, far out, beyond the last of my stones skipping in dents. I had thought you went to collect what I had thrown away. Your name from the force of my lungs did not sound right. The bob of your faraway head, nearly even with the surface, the faint halo as you descend. Uh, the next poem is called Marriage, and it does take its kind of cue from Phil, Philip Larkin's uh, really well-known poem, High Windows. So, Marriage. When I've got nothing to say to you, and you've got nothing to say to me, then I know we've reached a perfection we've been dreaming of all our televised lives. It's a white blank field of no dreams. Down on knees, this pew requires as I contemplate the hows and whys of martyrdom and the saintly vows to Christ our Lord, shepherding out wolfish urges to skulk and stalk the princely wares this fine green bright day of rest. We are one long fall in tandem, you and me, glossing the heavens with our small cries of we and woe. I am cautious mostly, you too. We've gone deep in this pasture of what lies ahead, We've scrutinized every blueness, sky, wave crest, diamond, shard, a comprehensive glass through which we face one another, partial, self-esteem. The next poem is titled The Drift. Last time you were here, I let slip I want no other happiness. Across your cheeks rose a flush, your head lowered under the midday sun that turns the palms the patina of an overexposed photograph and the date tree's leaves a celadon glaze to take in, I thought, my words. Right then, some tough guy type with a souped up muscle car muffler blasted by and I said, what an idiot, and forgot right then to ask you why the sudden blush Come to think of it, why the downturned corners of your mouth? As I recall now what was and wasn't answered that afternoon we walked through my neighborhood of fixer uppers and overpriced bungalows recently flipped. Dandelions blazed and fuzzed in the overgrown lawns, and I plucked one, 
a childlike impulse since lost, and brought it without guile to my lips to make one final foolish wish. I'm in the home stretch. I have two more for you. I hope you all are doing okay out there. This is titled Ghost. This time, I won't drop my chin down toward the floor, won't slip out the door as though covered in thin fabric, ghosting myself away into night. This time, I will search the crowded room for your face. I will find it, will hold it in my gaze for as long as I possibly can. I will take in your eyes, darkly green under your brow, the upswept smoothness of your cheekbones still drawn with boyishness. I will look once more the length of your effortless stance, hip out just so, that relaxed lean when you, that relaxed lean you do when you know you are center of the room. I will not forgive myself if I fail to do this. The wind has kicked up and all the trees react with their branches jostling in waves. The air rises with sea salt and the skin prickling twinge of electricity as pressures change. If you glance back, it will be okay. I won't for once pretend I don't see. It will happen this way. I will absorb you every drop and then off I'll go. Finally, uh, the last poem is titled, This Garden is of My Own Making. Let's not talk about all the ways one can exit, for instance, through blaze, through wither, the very tactics the cone flowers from the hillside garden perfected years ago. I hate goodbyes, though stay is a word for dogs, the most disciplined part of me might say, if I dig deep through the rocky grub-filled soil. Thankless task. We are so good at finding the wrong distractions, plots to shape and tend. I've been trying to figure what are you to me before I knew. Now among the daisies and sage, I sit with my failed rhetorics, all my loves that ended and still are. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, Emily. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, series of poems. Uh, that was terrific. Uh, and delighted that you also read uh, some of your, your uh, current work, your new work, uh, just as John did. So thank you. Um, well, let's, uh, we'll take a look, see, and folks, you can put in a comment uh, if you'd like to on our on our Facebook uh, page, going live here, uh, ask John Lane uh, and Emily Roscoe anything you'd like. Um, we we often Emily, have. I love I love that line. Overpriced bungalow recently flipped. <laughs> I mean, even if I didn't know what those words meant, I just love the sound of it. Oh, thanks. Well, that's my neighborhood. That's just the state of real estate down here in Charleston. It's, it's poetry, too, though. I mean, it's really wonderful. Yeah. I went, ah, and I wrote it down. Oh, thank you, John. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I love your poems as well, too, the way you harness repetition in your, in your longer poem, the final one you read. Really beautiful. I just, I love your sense of, I feel like you're like the original eco-poet, you know? Like, you were doing that well before it became trendy, so... You're a trailblazer. Thank you. Yeah, well, this is one of the very nice things about this format is that we, you know, we bring together uh, folks and, uh, you know, these wonderful poets and right here in South Carolina. But um, so John and Emily have, have gotten to, to connect as well as with each other, as well as connecting with us. Um, and so that's, that's a great thing going forward. And John is this, this wonderful, uh, eco-poet, um, ecological poet, as well as writer. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's something he was doing uh, long before it was cool, as Emily says, and continues to do. That's, that's his dedication. Um, and uh, so, you know, just to, 
I guess to ask a, a question sort of following on there, uh, where do you get your inspiration, each of you? Um, what, what drives you to write these poems? And you want to start, John, or what do you say? You want me to go first? Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's, diff it's been different for me along the way. I think um, I'm often drawn to uh, other writing. I mean, that's, that's going back to John's advice to yeah. read a lot. Other people's writing sustains me, right? And it uh, keeps me saturated in the possibilities of what language can do. So I'm, I'm constantly inspired by other poets and other uh, writers who write with a very kind of poetic manner. But also for like weather inventions, I did a lot of research. I was, you know, exploring things like the rise of the new science in the 17th century. So very sort of historical facts and research sort of inspired me to write some of those poems. And then these later poems that I, the newer work that I just read for you today, a lot of that actually is, is getting to be inspired by just memories and thinking back along you know, it's different episodes in my life that felt very pivotal. Absolutely. Wow. So that I was, I've been doing this crazy exercise. When you're 66, you can begin to do stuff like this. And that may, nothing may ever come of it, but I've got 40 years worth of journals. And um, I decided to go back to 1977. And on my iPhone, um, basically, I'm, well, I wasn't going to go through and, write them out. So I just go and I would, I would just speak these journal entries into my iPhone. Um, and one of the crazy things that I, um, that I noticed was back about 1980, I made a real shift that I, that I wrote poems, um, early in my first published poems, poems that in my first book were, were much more layered with natural history and my own relationship and and the natural history would become metaphors for my own struggles with my partner or whatever and um and Emily I love that that you're there I mean that's one of the things that gives you power as a poet is you're you're trying to figure out what is the compost pit you know yeah. have to do with how I'm feeling inside you know and stuff and and then I wrote in my journal about 1980 that I wanted to turn myself more outward, which you can't do as a poet. I mean, I'm, I know that now, but I, I kind of pretended or fooled myself into believing that all I had to do was walk in the woods more or learn more natural history, and then I could I could make a different kind of poem. And I, I realize now, looking back, that that I, I've written the same poem <laughs> for 40 years, you know, in some ways. I mean, I, um, I haven't, my, my inspiration has been constant it's been the natural world but also the way that that reflects my inner world my as, as my so that became clear yeah yeah and i love uh you know john's poems listening to him they're they're always so detailed uh and and you know you feel like you're right there in it in that that uh in the ecology that John's describing, and he knows. Falling down oak tree. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You're you're worried about that. You're you're inside the dilemma of limbs of that that worrying oak tree. You you feel the tension, but yeah, you're you're in that that space, and I love those details. And I know John, one of your your piece of advice that you gave last time you were here was attend. You know, pay attention, and uh, really in a kind of a deeper Zen-like sort of way that we need to, to really attend to our, our surroundings, our natural surroundings. But Emily has, you know, throughout her work, there, there are uh, images of, of nature and trees, and, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit different. It's not as, you know, we're not as detailed or as, uh, you know, we don't feel the ruddy earth as much in our fingertips, but, but they're there, earthworms and... Uh, um, and uh, deconstructing things. So, yeah. How would, Emily, how, how do you use those? How do, why do those uh, things attract you, those, uh, I guess, uh, natural images? And, and how do you feel like you're using them in your poems? I mean, I think the power of image in a poem is always that it carries the freight and weight of the internal emotion. And this is really kind of echoing kind of what John was just saying, I think, as well. It's like that's the poet's tool description, very careful, attentive description, 
right? And um, using the external world to be able to sort of funnel the self through it, right? Because that's, it's, it's so much more interesting, right? To feel the kind of gloom of a landscape rather than to just say in a poem, oh, I was so depressed, you know? You know, right? Like if that's, you know, yes. that's not fun for a reader. A reader wants to be able to feel they're part of that mood or they're part of that um, psychological landscape that's happening in the poem. And so that is definitely when description, detail, image, metaphor are your best tools for harnessing those energies. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you feel, uh, I love the voice. Uh, you, you do feel connected to the speaker um, throughout your, your poems, Emily. There's a, that kind of emotional connection. You're, you feel like you're in that you're sharing the situation with the the speaker there's that as you talked about uh that that deep that unified space between the uh between the speaker and the reader um and you know john invites us in in a, in a different way but it, it you know uh but it's wonderful we're, we're kind of out there tromping around in the soil with him um, and and engaging with uh, the wildlife out there um yeah, I, i've been thinking a lot about um and Emily, your poems really helped me to think about this, and I'll think I'll think about them a long time because of that. But I've been thinking about how as a and I and I I'm sorry I keep talking about my age, but I, but I've been thinking a lot about what it is to be a 66 year old poet, and um, and how I learned to write poetry when the self was more stable. Um, or um, with some poets, G.C. Walter would tell me, John. There were plenty of unstable self poets in 1975, but my poets were Gary Snyder and um, and um, and um, and and I think of in some ways Mary Oliver as a poet that you know has an has a stable self in some ways. I mean, and um, and I um, I think a lot about um, will I carry the stable self through to the end of my career or will and, or will I abandon it at some point? <laughs> you've got a, you've got you a turtle. Grew, Emily, you probably came of age more in a time when the unstable self was everywhere. Yeah, you know, I, as I think on it now, because I see this through my own students, I still think I was part of that era that uh -huh. didn't want there to be things like politics or identity kind of issues wrapped up in your poems. I think there was a strange sort of we had to be more academic kind of style, you know, with the kind of flat lyric guy who could be anybody, yeah. right? And I'm still very attracted to that idea. But I'll tell you, when I see like the work that the new generations are doing right now, um, speaking to really important sort of social justice issues or experiences they've had growing up, it's 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 super potent and so powerful. So yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this conversation except to say that it's marvelous how poetry I it think really is. Years, has, it, has you, opened you, the door for you. It just moves, just like you just can't stop it. That's what's so exciting about it. And for all you poets out there, I mean, just, you know, revel in that. Yeah. Revel in the change, revel in the difference. Yeah. Well, I had another question for both of y'all. <laughs> Listening, uh, one thing I noted. Uh, was just the the wonderful closing lines in in both your your um, in your poetry across your poems and how do you know uh, how to end a poem or or when to end a poem you know how do you get to those those final lines that are yeah you know, that, that are so uh, powerful well the other advice I would give besides read 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 is it revise, 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 and you continue to, to look. And, you know, when I was reading through these, I'm going, there was a couple places where I'm going, is that the way, place to end this poem? Or do I need to end it two lines before? I mean, so constantly like reading out loud and, and thinking about, about that, you know, the ending is always there unless you have to, unless it's not. <laughs> um, but, but just being aware and conscious that, the revisions where it comes comes to you, at least for me. Yeah, I would say, you know, the most to me, the most important parts of a poem are the first line and the ending line. Right. And certainly as an editor, a first line is very important for for sort of welcome you welcoming me into that poem's world. 
and understanding the kind of mood or landscape we're entering. But there's something about endings too that. I think I always feel a kind of like a rhythmic surge that kind of somehow comes out of my, like my body. I mean, I'm sorry to sound so kind of like woo woo here with this, but there's a kind of rhythmic closure that I sort of, I'm looking for what's my last line going to be. And I'm sure if you studied last lines across my work, you might notice, well, I tend to, I think do doubling at the end. Like there'll be like a, this and a, that kind of thing that happens, or there might be a sort of um, slant rhyme or, slightly more perfect rhyme that kind of helps close the poem off too. Mm -hmm. Um, I like the feeling of a poem ending and it's, it's almost like the door is closing shut, but yet there's a little bit of a crack. So it feels like the poem also lifts off or opens up to other possibilities. Mm -hmm. I feel like I was saying that very abstractly. So I'm sorry if that didn't come across very well, but it is, it's strange. It's it's these strange instincts that you hone over time to kind of know like, Oh yeah, that's the resting spot. That's the last line. That's the note I want to go off on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that that closing note. Um, so it and it it takes a practice and revision, uh, but yeah, it, it needs there. You need a little something. Uh, you want to end with a with a bang, not a whisper, I guess, a whimper. Um, <laughs> though maybe sometimes it's appropriate. <laughs> To end with yeah. a, a whimper, like uh, off I go, I think is, I don't know that that's a whimper, but a wonderful final line uh, from Emily. But uh, yeah. And um, how would you say that uh, that you're, you're both teachers? Um, how would you say that teaching has affected your poetry or vice versa? How has your poetry, writing poetry, affected your teaching? I mean, those two aspects of um, being a writer and teaching writing are so intertwined for me. I feel like teaching is a wonderful arena where I can clarify my own thinking about a poem or about the poetic process. So this activated voice thing that I kind of talked about with, with you all today, I mean, that's something I taught for many semesters in my poetry classes. And then I finally wrote a little pedagogical essay on it, too, trying to sort of take those lessons from the classroom and clarify it for myself more. Um, So it's really hard for me to separate. I'm energized by my students. They constantly keep me on my toes and teach me new things about how to better explain poetry, how to read more deeply, how to think within their own intentions and their own sensibilities. I had an interesting um, journey as a a teacher writing in that the first um, few years that I taught writing, first in the University of Virginia when I was a Hoynes Fellow, and then um, later I was a poet residence in a, a three or four places, and I was always teaching writers. I was always teaching people who wanted to be writers like Emily does. Um, she talks about her undergraduates or graduates, but generally probably a lot of the people who stay with her are undergraduates you know, so we're going to be writers. So even though she has to teach more, there, there. Uh, and for me, it was um, I, I really spent a lot of time thinking about teaching writing and teaching poetry in those early years. Say from the time I was about twenty-eight till I was until I got to Wofford, and then when I got to Wofford, um, it was a small liberal arts college in nineteen eighty-eight, and it had a total of one creative writing. <laughs> and you know, Trey could talk. And he wasn't going to give it up. And so over time, I convinced them that we could do more writing classes. And I got to teach some, but we never had, um, until the very end of my time with English, concentration in creative writing. So I wasn't teaching writers as much. And then I created the environmental studies program, and I was the humanities professor in it. And then I wasn't teaching writers at all. <laughs> All the students in my writing class were just in it because they wanted to know a little bit about how the humanities and the environment fit together. But, but um, so having for the last decade had many students who who enriched my writing. Instead, they enriched the process without paddling and stuff. But, um, but I've had an interesting journey in that way. 
Yeah, well, and we've been along on that that journey, John, for quite quite some time. Uh, you take us along <laughs> down the river and into the mountain, into the woods. Uh, so it, we um, we're glad you're you're continuing to journey, um, even though you keep mentioning you're at the the ripe old age of sixty six. You don't you're 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 very, you're right, but you're very young still. You're very fresh and and still evolving. Just as uh, y'all talked about how poetry, uh, it, it's always moving. It's always evolving, uh, as we saw yeah. yesterday at the presidential uh, inauguration. Uh, uh, youth Great poet. Example. So uh, it's it's there with us, and we're we're so thankful uh, for both of y'all. Uh, being with us here today and those wonderful uh, poems that you shared uh, that will give us, you know, we'll get to go back and, and uh, re-read them, re-hear them, listen to them again, because uh, there's a lot of depth to uh, what John and Emily are doing here. And thank you, too, for that, uh, the wonderful writerly advice uh, as well. But we loved, loved having y'all. And... Uh, very grateful that uh, to to be able to showcase uh, two very distinct uh, poetic voices uh, right here in South Carolina. So we we've got a wealth of, of talent here, uh, and and you two are are two of the best going. So thank you. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Dan. This was really fun. Yeah. Same here, Don. Dan, thank you so much. This was so fun. It was great to spend the morning with you. Uh, Thank y'all so much, and uh, John Lane and Emily Roscoe, um, uh, they, they were here with us to kick off the 15th annual Litchfield Tea and Poetry. Uh, next month, we'll have Marcus Amaker and Lynn Lawson joining us uh, in February. So um, thank you again, and of course, uh, you heard their, their books, some of them mentioned. You can look them up online and, and, and order those books. Normally, we'd have a book signing afterwards, but uh, uh, today we, we've got to do it virtually. Uh, but uh, hopefully this gave folks a taste, and they will uh, pursue, those, uh, uh, pursue those collections because they are, they are indeed uh, excellent poets. Thank y'all so, so much for being here, and um, take care and have a wonderful day.